You're listening to Investify, preaching financial independence and assisting investors to achieve a more flexible and free lifestyle through smart financial planning and real estate investing. If leaving the corporate world and jumping into this thriving industry is what you desire, tune in and listen to stories of like-minded individuals who made the leap to financial independence. Equip yourself with the right tips and tricks to start your real estate journey, making active or passive ventures that are highly profitable and rewarding. Here are your hosts, Craig Kerlop and Ziana McIntyre. What's going on, everybody? You are listening to Investify. My name is Craig Kurlop, aka The Fi Guy, and I'm here with my co host, Ziana McIntyre, aka Z Money. Yeah. Z, how are you doing today? Oh, Craig, it's, it's a nice day, but it's mixed um, as we haven't announced yet, but we're going to talk about a bit in the show. And I actually think this is the perfect show for. What we're doing is I'm actually stepping away from the podcast. So we're, we're both having a little bit of bittersweet feelings about it. And part of my reasoning about that is just wanting. There's no, there's no sweet. <laughs> yeah. Part of my reasoning about it is just wanting to live an example of the life that I want to show people they can have. And that's around financial independence and having time and space for myself so, yeah, that's a little bit of, of what I'm going off to do, but I, I'm still going to be around and maybe I'll pop in here and there for a couple of shows, but I can't be committed to this full time anymore. So have you figured out who is going to be here? Are you going to have just kind of a few people sliding in and out? Yeah, so, you know, this is super sad for us, obviously. We're going to miss you. There's there's only going to be one Z money and of course, that's you. Um, and you know, we haven't we haven't a hundred percent nailed anybody down yet. Um, I'm in conversations with a couple people, but you know, we're gonna have some interim hosts here in the next few weeks. Um, and then when we find somebody to truly nail down, um, then we will, you know, we'll move forward. But you know, the show is not gonna change too much. Hopefully, I mean, of course, the dynamic between me and the next co-host will change a little bit. Um, and you know, in, in the Woo woo questions may be a little bit less depending on who we get, but we love your woo woo questions. Yeah. And, um, you. you know, yeah. So, you know, we'll, again, like, I think, I think this truly is the perfect episode for you kind of moving on and just taking a step back and, and enjoying life a little bit more because we got the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Money Mustache, AKA Pete Adney on the call. And it's funny because I think his, his, his blog used to be, anonymous i don't know who blew it up but i think it's very not anonymous now um and so otherwise i just spilled the beans but um yeah (laughs) like such a good episode and i think pete pete's been an inspiration to me like man ever since i first started so i don't know where he fits into your journey z but um just such a wonderful guy yeah pete is the person that first told me about financial independence i found him at the beginning of his blog which was back in 2011 um and it was after i had a journey with Susie orman and i was trying to just figure out personal finance and i got to see oh my gosh there's there's a way to speed that up there's a way to possibly retire by 30. i think i was 26 at the time um, and so, yeah, getting to know him and have him as a personal friend now is just such a gift. And I feel like I'm learning so much from him all the time. So this episode is, you know, no exception. I think we talk about a lot of really important concepts, like how much you actually need to retire. Should you be afraid of a recession? Um, understanding the concepts of frugal versus cheap. There was just so many things in here that were really reassuring for me on my journey. So I encourage you guys to listen all the way to the end. It's a great show. Yeah, Pete. Pete just drops mm-hmm. tons of you know tons of practical advice as well as tons of more general stuff as well. Um, and it's it's really good. Again, like if you haven't listened to Pete, any of Pete's interviews, like you got to listen all the way through because this is this is just amazing. So, all right, well let's let's enough of our jib jab uh, and let's get Pete on the show. Pete. 
Adney? Is it actually, I don't even know how to say your name. Is it Adney or Adney? <laughs> Adney? Uh, yeah, Adney. Adney, Pete Adney, a.k.a. Mr. Money Mustache. Welcome to the show, my friend. You're missing your mustache, though. I think I, I inherited it from you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for taking care of it. It's, it's too much work for me to maintain this thing. It's like a pet. It really is like a pet. It's like, you know, multiple times a week, you got to trim down here and trim up here. And yeah, it's a Z. I know you wish you could feel our pain, but you know, obviously you can't. Um, so Pete, I want to hear the origin story and I want to take it back to when you, when you as like the founding father of this financial independence movement, movement, when did you first hear about financial independence? Um, I first heard about it long after I was already retired because I wasn't really blogs that I knew about back in 2005, which was my original sort of retirement date. And it was just a normal quirky engineer's way of living. And um, I apologize, first of all, to anyone who's heard me on other interviews, because this question has been answered a million times, but, but certainly fun to reminisce. So anyway, that went on for like six years. And then I uh, had a little boy who was about six years old by that point. And then I said, hey, why is nobody else doing that? And then I started writing about money and early retirement. And then it still wasn't until a couple of years in that I realized a lot of people had done this before and there's all terminology to go with it, like early retirement, financial independence, like the 4% rule for how much you need invested to retire off of. And, and then on the real estate side of it, like you guys um, podcast about nowadays seems to have come up a bit more recently. Like it's, it's become interlinked with the fire movement in a nice way yeah so so would you say you kind of discovered this on your own without like hearing of anything you just have like that engineer mind where you're like oh well if i save enough money and just achieve four percent then well that's pretty simple math or like was there something yeah. that happened it wasn't even based on four percent so i apologize i did kind of jump ahead of the origin story so if you go back a few more years before that is i started working as an engineer at like really before I was 20, because I was working uh, in the summers in between the terms of engineering school. And then, yeah, you get pre paid pretty well in that field. It's not like doctor money or anything, but it's more than a frugal person would learn, uh, would need to live on. And since I grew up in a family without a lot of luxuries, to me, I thought I was living like super over the top, you know, like having my own car and super nice clothes and apartment and whatever. But I always try to optimize things. So I wanted to enjoy life, but just not waste money. So I always found my little tricks of like, oh, yeah, I can use this thing for two purposes. Or I can share a luxury house with my friends instead of renting a crappy apartment by myself. And yet it costs more, costs less to do that. So after doing that for a number of years, um, I had enough saved up such that the passive money from just having it in index funds, you know, and having a paid off house was enough to retire on and just quit working. And by that time we were, uh, I was about to get married and we were thinking of having a baby. So it was perfect timing because we both wanted um, to have the free time to be able to raise this child instead of mm -hmm. being having to focus on work eight hours a day. Yeah, for sure. And so, so did you just kind of like fascinate with seeing that number in your savings account or your investment account just grow? Like were you systematically putting aside each month? Or Yeah, it was kind of, um, like it was haphazard because there, the fire movement, I wasn't aware of it back then. All I wanted to do was just live a great life and invest the balance. And, and of course, yeah, my future wife, actually future ex-wife, but wife to be at the time and I were saving together in order to, to have this baby. And we watched our, we would just shovel all of our extra money after enjoying you know, our normal lifestyle each month, shovel it into Vanguard index funds. And we had like a little mini competition. Oh, look how much my balance is growing. Look how mine's doing. And, and uh, you know, those numbers would just grow over the years. It wasn't an obsession. It was just a fun little hobby. But eventually it starts to really catch up to you, especially if you get little windfalls like a bonus at work or a bigger tax return than you expected or whatever, or a raise. Uh, that stuff really starts to grow after more than five years of doing it. And then pretty much, you know, almost exponentially just pushes you over the edge. And then... Mm -hmm. um, and then you can declare yourself retired if that's your your desired path. Mm, super, super exciting. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, I mean, I think that's unheard of, really. I think in two thousand five, maybe by like a, a small few percentage, maybe someone who read Vicky Robin's book or something like that. And so, I guess, what was that date like? Were you scared at all? Because since you were kind of like the first person that you may have known of that done it, like you know, in 
you're 30, you're about to retire and like, you know, or you just no. saw the numbers. <clears throat> I didn't even find it. Strangely enough, I didn't find it remotely scary, but probably because I knew that there's always a, there's always different ways to make money. Like, of course I could have gone back to doing more software engineering if that was my desire. Like if I'd somehow catastrophically made a mistake and all the money just vaporized, but that, that really doesn't happen. If you understand what investing is, like your money is there for life. You know, as long as the United States economy continues to exist, then if you have a bunch of solid investments, whether they're, you know, index funds or real estate, uh, it's going to be there and it's going to be producing value for you. So it's, you're never going to just poof, run out of money, but you might over a long time period say, hey, I realize my income's a little lower than I would like it to be. And of course, you could go back and earn more money one way or the other. For me, it's like software engineering, but later I came to prefer carpentry for my um, my passion projects these days. And, and that's an easy way to make money if I chose to do so as well. So those are like, those are ways to get you over the, the fear. But I think for me as an engineer, I think of numbers and numbers are reassuring to me. Like there is no sort of just pure emotional con context of like fears or you know, hopes even. I, I mainly just look at the numbers. I'm like, yep, these look solid to me. Mm, I love that. I love that. That's like the engineering brain that you've got. And so like, what did it take to get your, I guess, future ex-wife, future wife on board with this? Was she just on board the whole time? Or she engineer mine too? It was easy just to show her the numbers? Yeah, I think so. She's, and we're still like really close now. We're still co-raising our almost adult son now. And she's always been a, a smart lady and very you know, easy to convince. She, she's a fast learner, so she's easy to convince of things that are that are objectively pretty true. <clears throat> and then now, you know, she still uses that those skills to run a really fun hobby business uh, that's more than a hobby now. It has employees and everything. But again, she's doing that because it's it's a fun thing to do when you already have enough money. Awesome, cool. So I guess um, so. Kind of like the early the the two thousands, like that decade was you know, you retired, you kind of figured out that you figured out about the whole financial independence movement. And then you mentioned that you started to write. Uh, and is that because, I mean, I don't really know that many engineers that also like to write. Is that something that you just enjoyed doing? And it was just kind of a passion project that obviously blew up into what it is today or. Yeah. 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 I definitely didn't think like, I'm going to start a website so I can make money or whatever. I mainly, mm -hmm. I, uh, I happen to have always liked writing and, and music and stuff. I'm kind of like a split. Uh, and this is just comes from my family. Like it's all a bunch of engineers who are also hippie, like musician, writer, artsy people. Mm -hmm. So the, the real passionate, you know, meaningful stuff for me comes from these more artsy things, even though engineering is like something I enjoy doing too. So anyway, writing, I liked doing it before I had the job in engineering and then didn't get to do quite as much as a software engineer, although there's a surprising amount in that job too, especially if you're managing people. And then once I quit, then I got to write however, as much as I wanted. And I just had this message that I really wanted to get out. That's, that's the real thing is like, I was really frustrated at the inefficiency of this whole American consumer culture and everything from like the cars and the debt and the money and like people being stressed out and not even be able to raise their own children. So that gave me a lot of motivation to write and just like share these lessons. And I didn't, you know, didn't expect it to catch on and have a bunch of people reading it, but that really helped me keep doing it more once that happened. Cause obviously once you have an audience, it's like, it's quite motivating to keep going. Yeah. One, one thing that I think is that I'm gathering here too, is that like, you didn't do it because of the money. And when you do things because of the money, usually it ends up being more of a drag, right? It, it becomes harder to do. But if it's just something you do, like you love it because you're writing, you don't even see your numbers. You don't see any of your comments. You don't know anybody's there. Like you might even still be writing it today because you just love writing so much. Uh, and so like, and that's my, also might be, I'm wondering like, because you have that unique perspective of like engineer and writer, I wonder if that's why it was so popular because it is kind of unique to have some writing that's actually like to the point, no bullshit, just like, stop spending money, right? Yeah, well, that's a good point. And thank you for saying that. Um, you're right, it probably, like I noticed when I would, was thinking of writing an online you know, platform, I would go, I went out and read other financial writing, including in books and websites. And I was like, this is all kind of 
dry and there's not enough opinion in it and there's not enough specifics in it. Like when you, when you take a course on writing like fiction or how to write well, the first thing they tell you is like everything has to be a story and everything has to have details. Like, so for example, you would never say, you might want to save up for a car or a vacation. No, you'd say like you, you're obsessed with the new Tesla Model S or you're excited about taking your kids to like, and then you, you name a specific place, you know, like the, the Bahamas and a specific name of a city and beach. Like that's what captures people's imaginations is like you need to have specifics and stories. And that style of writing is like every novel is written that way, but financial writing is very rarely written that way, maybe because the people doing it weren't writers in fiction before, or maybe because they thought it was taboo and they would be offensive. And I think I accidentally broke both of those conventions by just making stuff that's like has opinions, it has swearing in it and personal stories and details. And, um, and then, yeah, the engineering side, like, so I can actually put real numbers and say like, yeah, your furnace should be like three Fahrenheit colder if you want to save $500 a year or just whatever, that, things like that, where you can actually calculate it and you don't have to just make, you know, bullshit, fluffy uh, generalizations. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. Um, and so I guess, um, what was, you know, this, a lot of people that come on the show are real estate, though it's not technically a fully real estate podcast. Did real estate come into your picture at all? Did you ever think about that through your savings or were you just one track mind, save, 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 and just put it in index funds because it was super passive? Um, I came to appreciate real estate later and I still think it's nowadays, if you can do the work, it's probably still the fastest and most efficient path to financial independence if it's like interesting and you're good at it. So my exposure to real estate was more accidental. I was one of those landlords, you know, like you move out of a house and you decide to keep it and just rent it out. And that happened a few times, usually for the best, you know, like the house is appreciated and they generated good cash flow. So they provided a little bit of a boost, although it was a, it was after retirement, right? Because we retired after from the context of our first house as a couple. So it really wasn't like uh, stepping stones of, of boosting financial independence. And then the interesting part is I went through the financial, like the housing crisis of 2008 and nine and beyond, like that was after retirement. So instead of, um, you know, instead of using that as a, a boost, like many people who invested in houses during that crash, they had amazing returns. We had the opposite of like, Oh no, our wealth has shrunk down because it's hard to sell the houses that we might want to sell. And, uh, renting was never a problem. There was never a vacancy problem. But yeah, so my personal story, real estate is a smaller part of it. And I mostly use real estate for joy. Like I have a house that I'm in right now that I absolutely love. Um, I love working on it and building stuff. And I happen to own it mortgage free, which I find is a really nice, you know, just like a grounding and helps me feel like uh, life is very safe. And there's no like the monthly mandatory bills are very low which allows me to feel like all of my spending is fun and optional. Financially, like I would have been better off keeping a mortgage, uh, like a 3% interest mortgage from back in 2021 on this property, but uh, money is all about emotions anyway. So it's emotionally more pleasing to keep things simple. So Pete, I one of the things I really admire about you is this security piece that you have. And I, I don't have the same thing. And I, I think it's something about way, the way I was raised. It always seems like you feel really safe in the decisions that you make, but maybe it's because you're also creating these layers of safety. Could you speak to like how it was in your household when you were growing up? Because I know you didn't come from much money. Right. And I would say my, my upbringing was kind of weird in, in that like, there was a bit of a scarcity mentality and in a way that helped me and all my siblings, there's four of us all together. It helped us all be good with money in the sense that we were frugal and we didn't waste it. And now we're all pretty well off, just, you know, self-made um, financial independent on a low level people. So nobody has to worry about money. It's great. But in a way we, we had to fight the penny pinching instincts that we grew up with and sort of whip them out of ourselves as adults, because it's really helpful at, when you're getting started to be super frugal, but you should really be r scaling that down the further ahead you get. And if you get, you know, when, once you have like way more than you're, you'll ever need, then you need to change your spending habits and, and just kind of like take the stress out of stuff and, and 
eliminate your thinking about small optimizations because those are like distracting you from bigger pictures. Like how can I be more generous or how can I be more fun? You know, when you get more money, that's a gift that can create a lot of fun for you and your friends if you keep your eyes open to it. So I think, yeah, we're lucky that we kind of we're self-aware enough, my siblings and I, to to get out of this. I think I see uh, Craig has a point here. Yeah. What are I'm curious as to like what are some things that you would suggest someone who's starting out, like specific examples of something that you probably shouldn't do when you're you know gaining the nest egg, and something that maybe you do now, now that you've got the money. Yeah. Um, I think, for example, if you're trying to get ahead, you should not be driving a nice car. You should be thinking of your car as an appliance and it's such a big thing, you know, like it can make a roughly $100,000 per decade difference between choosing something like a, you know, dorky, you know, like brand new Forerunner, Toyota Forerunner that's $60,000 or Honda Fit. Both vehicles do almost exactly as much as each other, but the one, the Forerunner versus the used Honda Fit is going to keep you about $100,000 poorer over like a less than a one decade period. So things like that. You know, it's a very small compromise, if anything, to do it. And it just boosts you ahead quite a bit. And then as you're doing that, you'll get more and more wealthy. And then you can really decide like, well, do I want to upgrade a little bit from from the old Honda once you can afford it? That's a good one because it's a, a six figure decision, right? Instead of agonizing over like, oh, I'm going to go to three different grocery stores so I can apply all my different coupons and save like maybe five dollars on your groceries, grocery bill. That's not really worth the time unless you enjoy it. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. It's um, yeah. focusing. Everybody says this, but focusing on the big stuff and making sure you question your spending decisions is good at all areas of life. But the wealthier you get, you have to like add this second little voice talking on your shoulder that says, OK, this will get you more money. But do you need more money? And would you prefer to do something else with this little decision making power? Yeah, I, I think I think the top three that's almost undisputed is going to be housing, transportation, and food. And so, like, yeah. house hacking takes care of the housing. If you drive a cheap car or even bike everywhere, which is I know what I did, and Pete, I know you did that for a while too. Um, biking everywhere, that you can eliminate those two expenses, then you've already at you're like a fifty percent savings rate compared to other Americans. And then the food thing, personally, I just think it's eat food at home versus go out to eat, and then yeah. you're probably going to save you know, probably 60% of what you would spend on your food bill if you were to go to eat it, just eat at home. And mm -hmm. it's simple, like at home foods, like I genuinely prefer to eat at home, not because it's cheaper, but it's actually better. Like if you, if you buy organic grass fed, grass finished, like we don't buy the cheap groceries. We actually buy the, the expensive groceries and it's still way cheaper and way healthier and all these other things. And so don't get me wrong. We, we, we do indulge once in a while and go out to eat, but like, the whole meals are where it's at. Yeah, definitely. And it saves a lot of time. Like restaurants are so mm -hmm. slow. Even if mm -hmm. you're going to a fast, you know, fast casual place like Chipotle or whatever, it will still take you a long time, like driving or getting to the actual place and then ordering and waiting for it and then carrying it back home or eating it there or whatever. You know, that's the fastest dining out. And then if you're going to go and sit down and order and wait for meals, like that's great to do occasionally because it's a fun experience. But if you're doing that more than, I don't know, a couple times a month, you really got to question yourself. Like, is this the most fun thing I could do with my evening or am yeah. I just doing it for food? Because if you're doing it at all for food, that's a waste. Totally. And yeah, just learn, learn to cook, stock your fridge with the best stuff. Never have an empty fridge never have like the bachelor situation where it's just like an empty white claw and an, and an egg in there. It needs to be like, stocked with great stuff so that way you're inspired to eat from your fridge yeah one one thing that like my wife and i are thinking about doing um and we kind of sort of did it once is like you just kind of create a restaurant in your house and so like you know i would go and take her order and like go make a steak right and i would just sit down and obviously make a steak for myself at the same time we'd go and like make a steak and grab wine it's like oh like a restaurant experience but at home and it's like Kind of cheesy, but it's kind of fun too. It was like a really nice like date night. We played cards after and like watched a movie. It was like a wonderful date night at our house. And so it was awesome. Yeah, that sounds I great. That I idea. mean, if you do a good job on the meal, hopefully there's more than just cards and a movie in it for you both too. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, yeah. <laughs> if I did a good job on the meal and there's enough wine. Um, <laughs> um, I, I like that you said this earlier, Pete, that 
it's important for you to think about why you're doing other activities that can make you money. Because I think one thing that happens is a lot of people get stuck in the comparisons of like, oh, well, this person's doing more and more and more, and I feel like I need to continue doing more and more. I know that's happened for me in my businesses when I could have stopped a long time ago. So how do you figure out where to put your energy these days? Do you have some kind of like questions you ask yourself or guidance on that? Yeah. Yeah, that's a super good question. And I've been thinking of trying to do another blog article about this because it's it's really uh, pervasive among people who have been successful with money. And it's like this phenomenon of my, mindless accumulation. Like you always think, wow, I could make so much money if I do this thing. And it's often you feel like it would be a waste not to do it. Once you become successful, you know, it, it can often make like thousands of dollars per day of work. So you're like, wow, I don't, I wouldn't mind an extra $5,000. I'm just going to do this. And then you keep doing it, keep doing it, and you keep putting this money on a pile and you don't really have any use for the extra money. Like if you really think about it. So to back it all out, if you really want to do an intervention on yourself, I like to have this little mantra where I say, I'm only going to do work that I would do for free. Um, anyway, you know, like what I do this, if, it, if I got paid zero, if the answer is no, I should not do the work, regardless of how much I get paid. And then the other thing is to train yourself for shopping. You try to make all your your purchasing decisions as if the price of the thing is zero. So like, you know, you're at the grocery store and you're like, God damn, the Dave's bread is seven ninety nine a loaf now. What? I, and I'm like, wait, no, that's old Pete. Like, what if it said zero dollars? Would you get the bread? I'm like, yeah, of course. So because it's not going to make any difference. Like you're never going to. Once you're wealthy, you're not going to have any use for that new money. Um, and if, once you are wealthy, you're not going to miss. You're not going to wake up and say, I wish I had another $8 because I spent too much at Whole Foods that day. So little games like that can really help you. And yeah, just cut yourself off and find other things to do with your time. And I think I've, I'm not perfect at it, but it, by being aware of it, it really helps you make changes. And to be honest, that's why you don't see a lot of blog posts from me nowadays on my blog is like, I know that it makes money when, when I get more traffic to that site. But um, I sometimes don't want, feel like sitting at the computer and typing. So on those days I don't do it. And as a result, the site slows down and I make less money and that's totally fine. What are you thinking, Craig? Yeah, I'm thinking that like, I wish I had your like, um, almost like discipline when it comes to saying me no. Me too. Um, because I like, so I almost, don't get me wrong, like, I, I, I love the team and I love everything that we're doing. I love helping people, but I find that I get, I, I slide into the like, I want to help people. I want to help people. I want to help people. And it's so hard for me to say no. And then before I know it, I'm like, holy crap, I've got like, you know, a team of 20 something agents and we're growing and helping tons of people. And it's like, it's like this amazing thing, but I'm like, where did that come from? You know? <laughs> um, and it's like, is there something that like you do? like an exercise that you do, maybe it's the mantra, but maybe it's something else to be like, if somebody asks you for something, cause Pete, I know tomorrow you could be a very busy man if you wanted to be. And so like, what is your, how do you just say no? Do you just, is it just as simple as saying no? Yeah, it is as simple. <laughs> it's especially tricky that what you're describing, Craig, because you're talking about, yeah, helping people is very powerful and good feeling. So that's working on your psyche from one side and then you're also making money from it. So that's another thing. And you're like, well, even if I don't need the money, I can always use it for, for philanthropy or like, who knows if I might have a use for it in the future. So it's just kind of like two things that are definitely good. And how do you say no to something's good? But the real thing is like, every time you say yes to those things, you're saying no to something in your personal life, whether it's like relaxing or, you know, spending time with your friends or traveling without work. So you really just have to kind of question yourself, like, is this, the number one thing. Um, the helping people is another thing. Like the world is is unlimited needs. So if you get too addicted to helping people, it's kind of a strange paradox because you can have a terrible life and help billions of people in theory at the limit of it. And that's not really what I would choose, even though it sounds like the noble thing to do because I'm too selfish. So you just have to cut yourself off and say like, whatever my form of helping is, I have to do some and then I have to keep some time for myself. Mm. So, and I know that in theory, like when I write things, 
um, on the blog, they're supposed to be helping people too, right? Like I only write things that I think will be useful to people. And then they, you get feedback in emails where people are like, yeah, this helped me a lot. And we've, we have time off now and we can raise our family. And I'm like, that's amazing. But I still have to take time for myself and just do what's right for me, even if it means creating less helpful stuff for other people. So I think the lesson is it's okay to be a bit selfish. If you've done some good in your life, it's okay to be selfish. It's not okay to be bad to other people, but I think it's okay to be selfish and not just be infinitely generous. Mm, okay, I like that. Mm, I needed to hear that. I think I always feel like there's one more person and if I stop today, that person will never find their way. You know, it's like, come on, nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. I'm not making that big of a difference. Yeah, and yeah. This, um, we are not yeah. indispensable, <laughs> right? Like all of us yeah. have our skills and people have, benefit from our work, but there's a million other me's and you's out there too. And like the less, when I step back, and in fact, I've seen this in my, in my little corner of the internet, which is fire blogger. When I step back, meanwhile, like thousands of other people are rising to surpass my work with their own blogs and YouTube channels, podcasts. And a lot of people are really good speakers. So they're doing um, public speaking circuits and a lot of people are filmmakers. So they're making great actual documentaries and everything. So it's way better than I could have done anyway. And you know what the super neat part about stepping back is, is that you can really focus on the most valuable things. So I, you know, write occasionally and then I'll just go on a few favorite podcasts, like the Invest to Pod Five podcast that I'm on today. You know, like yeah. I only had time Sweet. to do this because I was taking it so easy on all my other um, blog related stuff. And then I could shut right. off the computer after this and just make a super nice salad and go out for lunch or go out for a walk. I mean, and uh, it's a nice balanced day and I'm still staying engaged. On that note, I want to talk about staying happy after financial independence, because I think a lot of times people blame their job or the way their life is and how they feel day to day. Um, on, on something external, like, oh, I'm trapped in this job, so I, I'm not having a good life, but I'll be happy when. And I think that when people actually hit financial independence, they realize like, oh, you're not just going to be happy. You have to do things to maintain that status of happy. So can you speak to that a little yeah. bit about like what you do and what's worked for you? Yeah, right. You got to figure out what makes you happy. And as a human being, it's, uh, it's often surprisingly simple stuff. And when people hear the answer, they might be like, oh, well, that's, that's almost too easy. It's unsatisfying, but you just need certain ingredients in your, in each day, which for me includes lots of physical activity, preferably outdoors and an in creative time. I need low stress. I don't like to have too many people being like, Hey, you're late on this thing. So I, I keep my commitments low. Some people prefer a higher level of commitments, but you just, everyone has this different profile for happiness. And then the other thing I need is some, some in-person time with friends, you know, like new people and old friends. So if I get all of those things in my typical day, then I have a really great happy day. And I've said this before, I think on the Tim Ferriss podcast, but like the key to a happy life is really just a series of happy days because really all we have is the present, right? So, mm just working on that. If you have a terrible day, try to figure out what it was and also try to understand cycles because some people have like monthly, like hormonal cycles, whether it's monthly or seasonally or whatever, you know, you might have an awesome life and just have a feel sad one day and that's okay. Like you acknowledge like, you know, it's not my life. My life is not the problem. I just happen to have, you know, low energy today and I'm going to work on, you know, go out for a walk and do my health and get a good sleep and I'll probably have the energy back up soon enough. Hmm. I love Great. that. I, lo I, I love the like series of days equals a good life. And one thing I remember you, you said to me, uh, like probably over a year ago at this point, but I always thought it was funny. And it's like, something I'm aspiring to be is that you only like to do one thing a day, like commitment wise. And so you like, do you still stick to that? Or is that something that has changed at all? Uh, it's a general rule. Yeah. And this will sound okay. ridiculous to some people who like busy days, but for me, um, yeah, if someone's saying like, let's go out to lunch, um, and I have this podcast already planned today, then I would, and if they had asked me, you know, like a couple of weeks ago, I'd be like, you know what, I've got something going on that day. Let's do the lunch some other time. And furthermore, if possible, let's plan it like not too far in advance. So that way my brain, my tiny, easily confused brain doesn't have to think 
okay, next week I got the podcast and then I got the lunch and then I got to hike and I got to do this event at the headquarters. And th- like to me, and everything kind of jumbles up and I think about the future too much if I have too much in my future. Mm-hmm. So I've learned that about myself. And as I got older, um, it's it, that symptom becomes a bit more pronounced. So I particularly just keep things simple. Um, not everyone, it won't work for everybody, but I, I love the one thing. And then I can't be late. A lot of, you know, my younger busy friends are like, yeah, I'll be over right after I do these 10 things in the morning. And they're inevitably like just super late or blow it off entirely. And I think it's because they're putting too much into their days. Yes, I could totally see that. Um, Pete, I want to change gears a little bit here and talk a little bit about kind of the personal life as you kind of went. Uh, You know, we've alluded to the fact that you have a future ex-wife or an ex-wife. And so just curious, because I don't know if a lot of people have gone through divorces or going through divorces or thinking about going through a divorce, hopefully not, not something that I want to like, certainly like promote, but it is the realistic reality of life a lot of times. And so just curious as to kind of how that went. Um, it sounds like you're on great terms, but how that went with as you started to accumulate wealth and like, yeah, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's super common, especially in my generation, because people have typically been married like 10 to 20 years. So uh, that's like a natural time where it affects a lot of us. And in fact, I've kind of accidentally become like a men's divorce coach. (laughs) Sometimes like people will write to me with their stories. Like, and if they live here in Longmont, they're like, Hey, I think I might be, you know, my marriage is falling apart and I'm really, really worried. And we have children and we might be headed for a divorce. How do I handle this? And I'll like, I'll meet these people, these guys and go for, we'll go for a long walk and talk it all out in the forest and kind of, it helps to reassure people that it's, it's not the end of the world. It's just totally a normal thing. And, you know, everybody should, if you're married, especially if you have kids, you should try to be open and work on the marriage, but it's also not a shame if it doesn't work out. And as soon as you take away the shame and blame, it really makes it a lot better. And then, uh, that gives you a hope of coming through it as friends and and productive co-parents. And it lets you get on with the rest of your lives separately. And, And that part is really, really fun, actually. Like, so we've been split up for five years and <clears throat> you know the troublesome part was all done within the first year and now uh see me and i both benefit from the lives we have built you know around co-parenting and then the separate lives with our own separate dating lives and everything and it's really fantastic so it really helps uh being financially independent and kind of aware and not having hang-ups about money i think that really helps you have a successful divorce because that way people aren't going to be like penny pinching like i want this no i want this and there's like a shortage so like oh and now we're going to pay the lawyers and neither of us can afford to have a house anymore like that's the stuff that happens if you're either too greedy and or you don't have enough money to be able to afford to split up a relationship especially with kids involved so the better you are with money and like comfort with money then the more easy a splitting of any relationship, whether it's a marriage or just a long-term cohabiting relationship, the easier that's going to be. So I wrote an article about that when it first happened, but you know, now I have even more thoughts just because it's been so long and I, I feel very lucky about how we both came out of it. That's amazing. Yeah, I was going to point to your article because I thought that you guys did it in a really um, civil way, but also you did it really affordably and you kind of laid that out in your article. So I think a lot of mm-hmm. times people think, oh, well, I can't even afford to get divorced, even if I'm in a bad situation, uh, I'm stuck in it. But I think you said something yeah. about, you know, doing the papers for like 250 bucks and it was like not that big of a deal. So um, I'm not sure if I'm quoting that correctly, yeah. but <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. When you don't have lawyers involved, that saves you, you know, something in the fives, uh, you know, five to $50,000 in lawyer fees which in a bigger estate, you know, multi-million dollar estate, that the lawyers aren't actually a big part of the cost, but a much bigger issue is just, you know, the fighting and, and the greed that happens. Like I've talked to several, you know, in these guys that I've walked with and coached, they, some of them were very unlucky and they, they did have a, a vengeful partner who was trying to take like, you know, multiple millions of dollars, just kind of that they didn't need the spouse didn't need it because like the settlement was already going to be, you know, way more than enough for a family to live retired forever. But they were like, well, I just am mad at you. So I'm going to try to get even more or I'm going to try to take your business. You know, what's a really good podcast to listen to this on this subject is um, 
Mindy from Bigger Pockets interviewed Rachel from oh, Rachel uh, Richards. Yeah, Rachel Richards, and I yeah. think her she had like Money Honey was in one of her books or podcasts or something, mm -hmm. and she was very open about you know like getting through a divorce. It didn't I don't think they had children involved, but it sounded like there was some unfairness on her, you know, that was afflicted upon her because she happened to be the the breadwinner more so in the relationship. And I was really feeling for her as I watched that. I was like, oh my gosh, first of all, it's really brave of her to share that. And secondly, I'm like, I was on her side when I heard the details in the podcast. I'm like, that's not fair. She should have been able to keep that stuff. Like she worked for it. So yeah, I'd be pretty... Uh, Hardcore, if I was a divorce judge, I'd be like, you're being an asshole. Get out of here. <laughs> it'd be very much like, I don't care what the law says. Assholes yeah. lose. <laughs> Good, see. Um, yeah, we both know Rachel, so we kind of saw a little bit of that firsthand. And I think she handled it really well in a very stressful situation. Yeah, very um, mature, mm -hmm. which is cool. And that's the way to do it. Yeah. Like, even if you're getting screwed, uh, you try your best not to be screwed, but most important is be civilized and diplomatic and nice because that is a legacy you're leaving on that situation. Like you can only control your own behavior. So if someone is just being like horrible to you and you're like, well, I disagree with your behavior, but I just want to end this and best of luck with your life. That is something you can be proud of as the years go by and they will hopefully <laughs> come to see their behavior as not so good but you can be proud of how you handled it. And like money wise, you know, you can always make more money. Even if you're totally screwed in divorce, you're going to use that as a diving board or launching pad to just be like, I'm going to rebuild my life better, including my money life. And uh, I'm going to be proud of it. Mm -hmm. I love that. So you alluded to an amount of money that people can live retired with forever. I kind of heard you just say that a little bit about these people are trying to take more than they ever would need to live retired as a family. And I think there's a lot of discussion about this. I think in times before, people were trying to just make a million dollars in a year. And now I see more and more of my friends trying to make like a million dollars or not a year in their lifetime. And some people now trying to make a million dollars every year. And people like Susie Orman saying that, oh my God, you're going to need 10 million or more. Like don't don't think you can stop. It's dangerous. So I'd love to just hear your thoughts yeah. on that. Yeah, that stuff is ridiculous. I really, I've written entire articles about Susie Orman's bizarre fear-based stuff as well. Because the part that's really funny is like, let's say you have $1 million. I know that inflation has made that feel like a lot less. And to be honest, like when I retired in 2005, we had roughly like eight hundred thousand two you know dollars of those currency, you know, two thousand five dollars. So if you do an inflation calculator on that, it's almost doubled by this point because that was a long time ago. So you know, like one point five plus million dollars is what we had. Uh, so anyway, let's just go back to a million though. If you can, if you multiply it by four percent, right, then you can semi reliably rely on forty thousand dollars of spending money from that. So not everybody chooses to live on that level of spending, especially if they don't have a house with no mortgage. You know, I happen to have free rent, right? So I just have to pay property taxes. So for me, $40,000 on top of the free house um, rent would be more than I would typically spend, you know, unless I happen to buy a car that year or do some like extra giving or something. But it really just matters, like add up your spending and check with someone who's good at spending to see if there's any you know unnecessary waste in there and then multiply that by 25 that's your pretty safe retirement number and if you're really really you know fearful type of person then you can multiply your spending by 30 right because that's applying implying like closer to a three percent withdrawal rate closer to it not exactly and nobody should be more conservative than that you know like it's pretty much guaranteed that if you're withdrawing only in the three percent range from a portfolio, portfolio that's invested either in like good real estate or standard index funds, it's like you're set for life. So I really just focus on the spending and that's a skill too. You can really get better at it. So I happen to have low expenses because I'm kind of good at meeting my needs cost effectively, right? Like I, if I want to a deck, for example, on the side of my house, I just go to the lumber store and I buy a thousand dollars of really nice redwood and build this deck. 
and other people might have to spend fifteen thousand dollars to like shop around and find a contractor to build that same deck so that is just one example of spending and you know the worse you are at spending the more money you need to live on to meet the, the same lifestyle so everything is a balance because you know not everybody wants to become a carpenter or an expert thrift shopper or whatever so somewhere in the middle you can find the happy medium of the level of spending and the level of efficiency that works for you and multiply it by 30 and at that point you just need to stop thinking about money and and then focus on everything else um, that's involved in a happy life 2008 was the worst recession in almost a century and so now that we're on the cusp of what many people think is going to be another recession and maybe the you know the equity markets and the stock market or whatever they, they pull back 30 40 50 percent is it a time is it now like a should someone be afraid to retire right now if they're on that cusp? No, definitely not. So the thing is like what you just said, people say that every single day. They're like, oh, I know things have been good recently, but we're just about to have the biggest recession ever. It just depends on what website you read. Um, and that's generally never true. Like it's true that 2008, I mean, financially, it was not that bad of recession if you you know, like the unemployment rate went up to close to 10%, which means 90% of people still had jobs, right? So the US basically doesn't even have recessions, but the financial media, you know, plays up these tiny fluctuations. You know, if we don't set a new absolute record of like fire hose productivity, it's like a, a panic and a crisis. Like we're actually doing incredibly well and that's gonna keep happening forever, you know, barring some kind of World War Three you know, everything gets bombed into oblivion because like as long as humans are going to work and inventing stuff, the economy is going to keep doing well, which means real estate is going to continue to have value. People are going to continue to need renting rental units, which you might be offering as a service and stocks are going to continue to exist and pay dividends. So if the price of the stock happens to fluctuate a little bit like it did from, you know, actually from 2000 was a, a stock market peak and then it kind of didn't really go anywhere for quite a few years after that, um, that was still a great time to invest. And it was a fine time to be retired too, because there was still a flow of dividends. And if you're using like the 4% rule or a 3.5% rule, all that's already baked in. Like it's expecting that there might be such a recession and you can keep making your small, small withdrawals and living off it and your portfolio is gonna survive in the long run. Okay, I love that. So if you're on the cusp there, don't be afraid to, to pull the trigger now. Um, Pete, Since this Zika. is like a real estate show, not always, but often, I would love to hear about your co-working space and how that all worked out for you guys, because I think that was like a really fun, unusual partner project that you guys put together. Would you be willing to kind of share some numbers, how you guys found it, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, sure. The co-working space is a uh like our, also known as MMM headquarters in downtown Longmont is a commercial building that we bought. I bought with um, friends, wife and friends at the time in 2017. And then since then we've kind of bought that, that side out and now it's owned by me and like Carl and Mindy and our friend Bill. So um, it's basically purely owned by friends with no mortgage. And it was a funny origin story because we just happened to see this listing on Craigslist for it just said like, 712 main uh two hundred and thirty thousand dollars or something like no pictures no information but it, i knew that was a really good commercial address because it was right across the street from um one of the nicest pubs in town and it's all getting developed around there so super cheap for a commercial property the only problem is it was the most run down building i've ever seen like it was just all the windows were smashed with black garbage bags over them and you know the plumbing and electricity was just kind of strung together with like extension cords and shitty, you know, everything was in the wrong place. So I did a bunch of like super hardcore remodeling that year along with the friends. I think we filled three of the biggest kind of roll off dumpsters with the debris that was in that place and like all the crap materials that we ripped out. So many, many tons of crap and that I don't even know how I did it. I feel like I was more effective and, and fast and smart back then because like so much work happened in only about six months. And then by the time, you know, then we turned it around and opened it up as co-working space on one side and it was like a crafting like ceramics and soap shop on the other side. 
for the partners. And then ever since then, we've just been enjoying it. And it's not really about money. Like we charge really low dues for the headquarters co-working space members. So it pretty much just covers like the property taxes and maintenance on the building. And then uh, like an interest payment for us owners because we we put our own cash in to buy the building. And now like in theory, we've made some money on it because it's probably worth about 600,000 in today's market because it's like a 2,500 square foot building on a pretty big chunk of land because it used to be a residential land back in the late 1800s and it's surrounded by bigger buildings right and the houses in that area are they kind of start at 600 plus for a small house because it's right in the prime old town neighborhood so therefore in theory we've made some paper profits on that place too but that's not really what it's about um, we are possibly going to sell it in the next couple of years and reinvest in something else that's also community oriented but that's TBD. It depends if the market works and if there's a buyer and, you know, there's a couple other properties that we're in touch with like right next to us and we could sell the whole triplet as like a package deal perhaps. Mm. And then someone can make a really nice mixed use development on it. And uh, yeah, I would love it to make a bit more income, which just means getting more members for co-working because then we could do more interesting stuff with the building. But right now it's kind of it's Pete style. It's MMM style. It's running on a shoestring budget and trying to do really efficient use of its limited cash flow. And it's been quite fun to make it work. Nice. I'd like to hear more about projects. Like it sounds like this is not a motivator for you, that the motivator is community. And before we got on, you were talking a little bit about a project that you guys, I, I heard from Amanda, we're already under contract on in Salida. So I don't know what you guys are planning to do there, but is this a little bit like that community that you hinted at a few years ago where it would be like bikes only and all this stuff, or it's just a very small scale, fun rental project? Yeah, the one that you're mentioning, which is a just a house in Salida that's on two acres of land, a little over two acres, is more of like a friend's investment project. So the, the younger friends like Amanda and her partner and are going in on it to live there a lot of the time. And also th there's a lot of rental units that are possible in the large house and the separate guest house that are already on the property. So good good investment for them, maybe. And like the price is pretty high for this place. It's like $920,000. So it's a little bit hard to get a good cash flow from almost a million dollar property unless you have a lot of units. But there's other factors that make it good and it's going to be really fun to to work on it. And it has, it's right on the edge of the mountain biking trails at the edge of Salida and yet close enough to walk downtown and swim in the river. So I think we can make good stuff happen there. And another thing that'll be great at that particular property is I like the idea of hosting like camp mustache or camp Fi events there where maybe 40 or 50 people come and bring their tents and they sleep in, in a combination of the main lodge or out camped in the little mini forest. There's kind of a seasonal stream on the property too. So I like just all this hippie get together and spend weekends together, you know, and meet new people and sometimes give each other talks and have little workshops and, and hikes. That's, that's my jam, you know, that's my favorite thing to do is, and my real estate ventures are really just excuses to make stuff like that happen. I love that. That's, honestly, that's like one of my favorite things to do too. Uh, like just get a get a bunch of people in the house and like like minded people and just let the vibes let the vibes flow. Z, was there something else you wanted to mention? So I want to ask you about this Netflix special you just did. That's kind of like wrapping up our show here. But I know that for you, you kind of only really do things if they are fun. If it's something around community, what made you say yes to? this kind of project? Yeah, right. Well, I, I initially said no a bunch of times to that because I had done other things, you know, like that are on camera and I only enjoy them if they're pretty low key and, and casual. Like I don't really like scripted stuff or things where you have to repeat your lines or whatever. So I said no, but then the filmmakers, Atlas Films in this case, um, they showed me the other work they'd done and they've done these really good documentaries on issues that are pretty worthwhile and important to me. And they, their documentaries are always really well done. And then I checked with other people like Scott Rickens are, are playing with fire documentary people. And he's like, oh, Atlas Films, yeah, you should say yes because they're cream of the crop. So 
that kind of guilted me into doing it. And it was an enjoyable experience. And it was, it was like, I was just one quarter of the coaches, right? Cause it was four different coaches co coaching four different like people or couples um, for a year throughout the year 2021 on their finances and lifestyle to try to get more financial freedom. So um, in retrospect, it was totally worthwhile. It was a little harder than I expected because it turns out like once they said it was gonna be, you know, sort of guerrilla style filmmaking, they switched and they're like, nope, you have to do lines and repeating yourself after all. And, you know, there's a bit of a bit grueling at times, but that's just cause I'm not, you know, I'm a crappy uh, actor. Like I don't really like doing, doing lines or repeating stuff. But aside from that, it, you know, it was really fun to do and it's reached a lot of people, at least judging by the number of people who have come and like sent me emails about it and, you know, joined on the Instagram account and joined my newsletter thing that I have an email series. So it got a lot of people, even just from my little part of it, it got a lot of people exposed to the material. And so in that way, I'd say it's worthwhile. That's awesome. Pete, what's the documentary um, called if people want to check it out? Mm -hmm. It's called Get Smart With Money, and it's still on Netflix right now. Like, it's easy if you search for that. Awesome. I'm going to have to watch that. Maybe that'll conclude our steak dinner this weekend is the uh, <laughs> Get Smart With Money. <laughs> Love it. Um, so awesome. shall Z, we transition? Do you have anything else that you want to ask? Wow, totally on the same page. <laughs> um, yes. Let's transition to the... Final, final four. four. The final four. Uh -oh. clearly, this is, yes. clearly, this is scripted. Um, <laughs> we have a couple <laughs> little questions for you. They should be super mellow. Don't you worry, Pete. Um, question number one right, cool. is what are you reading right now? No, you're an oh, avid That's a reader. funny question. I happen to be reading more fiction at the moment, and I'm looking around mm -hmm. in case my book is here, but. So I got a friend staying with me uh, in my guest suite downstairs and we've been trading books. So I gave, I finished a book called Replay, which is a super nice, like masculine thriller about going back and reading, you know, reliving your life different times. And then she gave me a book called The Nightingale, which is like, I forget, it's a fairly recent book maybe. It's a historical fiction about World War II in Europe, but you know, with real fun characters and interesting action and tragedy. So I think that'd be pretty good. But I've been reading a lot recently. So I, I usually read nonfiction. I read a book from Jay Shetty, a new one that's called Eight Rules for Love on relationships and stuff. And uh, I don't know, because I wasn't prepared, I would have had a nice recent books list for you. But, you know, huh? I could follow up that's in the show notes if you like. You're that's good. what makes us fun. <laughs> All right, Pete. Second question is, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, don't have a particular one that stands out, but the best recent piece of advice I received is from uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman through his podcast it, that says uh, the first thing you should do every morning is get outside and get sunlight in your eyes, not staring at the sun, but like being outside in the context of sunrise and just go out for a walk before you do anything else. So like, don't make your coffee, don't sit down and start working on your computer. Don't even like check your phone ideally and just do a morning walk, even if it's 10 minutes. And that has these really powerful like neurological and you know hormone effects on your body that will really set the tone for a better day. So the reason that's amazing advice to me is that it's super simple, like pretty much everybody could do it. And yet it has a big enough effect on your day that it might be bigger than any other, much more complicated pieces of advice. Mm. I love that. Yeah, that's something that we try to do as well. Um, Same here. Because Huberman yeah. is the ultimate hacker. That's what these blue light glasses, I think, I think Huberman mentioned. This. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, you know what's question funny is that number If enough three. people follow uh -huh. that advice, it's going to change the entire world because the world is going to be full of happy walking people right after, you know, right at sunrise, which is how it should be. I got to train. And sunset, by right? Now, by right? We try to do oh. both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Question. Sunrise and sunset too. Yeah. Yeah. Question number three. <laughs> There's a lot of overlap. Um, is what is your why? Why do you do what you do? What keeps you going? My why is a little bit of what Craig said, which is helping people. I really like kind of my primary purpose in life to include 
helping people, whatever I'm useful at, whether it's writing or in-person stuff. I love helping people build stuff on their house and then helping my son, you know, just transition to being a young adult. That's the main purpose of my life. And then that's, you know, that's part of the overall package of it's just trying to live the most full and meaningful life that I can. Because now that I'm getting older, like 48 years old, then I, I realize that life is finite and you got to be kind of purposeful if you want to make the most of it. So I'm trying to really like, not really check the bucket list, but I'm, I want to live a great life as I have been doing for recent years. I just want to keep making the most of that. Mm. The one thing I'd say that. about you too is it's not so much what you're doing, but it's how you're living. Like I feel like you lead an example by living this life that's true to yourself. And that is, you know, stress-free and and more happy and all that stuff rather than being like, I'm going to spend all this time writing all these blogs and like going on Instagram and, you know, being in a bunch of shows or going and speaking on tour to help as many people that way. It's more like, no, let me just show you what a good life could look like. And it doesn't actually have to be so loud. <laughs> so I yeah, that's how I like that to imagine it. You. Hopefully that happens sometimes. <laughs> I think so. All right, Pete, last, last question or last kind of question. What is the weirdest date you've ever been on now that you're a single man and all? Ooh, weirdest date? Huh. <laughs> I don't know if I would, if I should uh, even describe this because all my dating life has been in recent years. So if some person involved might actually hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it, but that would be yeah. even funnier. Yeah, I don't think I, I don't, to be honest, I, I don't think there has been a weird, a, a nor, you know, maybe the weirdest one. No, actually, no, I can't even mention that. This person would definitely hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking, though. Someday. <laughs> okay. We're gonna have some... <laughs> Thank you for asking. Um, all right. I'm going to try to, we're going to get another one here. Um, okay. What do you think will be playing on oldies radio in 30 years? Oh, this is the funny part. I was just listening to oldies radio. Like for me, that's classic rock. And, uh, it basically just never changes. It's going to be music from the seventies and early eighties. Really? At least I think of, that's going to remain I'm, classic rock regardless. The stuff just doesn't age. And then, yeah. And then of course, at some point, Taylor Swift is going to be oldies radio. And, and then today's millennials are going to feel old. And then, you know, I don't even know who they, the youngest contemporary pop stars are, even though I listen to a lot of music, but if I if I had some of those names, I would drop those into the into the oldies radio. Shit. I always think that oldies is like Frank Sinatra, like Dean Martin, like that kind of thing. Is that not oldies anymore? Is that just like history now? Is yeah, that that's like, like deep, that's like history. Beethoven. Like, I yeah, mean, I've never even heard more than like a few bars of Frank Sinatra music, like in a movie or something, where it's trying to be like a period piece or whatever. Like people basically as far as i know don't really there aren't many people alive who listen to that hopefully that's not insulting to someone who does well, listen to it, but. my my grandmother if she listens she's gonna have a word with you um, yeah to be honest like stuff. <laughs> i feel like it wasn't until music started getting complicated that it earned classic status which to me i feel that happened in in the later years of the beatles and like the 70s and you know mm. when things started getting like trippy and multi-layered and experimental but still rather, you know, they still could be classic rock or, you know, the nerd rock, like uh, Rush and stuff. Yeah. I like that as a teenager and I still like it sometimes now. And that for me, that kind of locks it in because like it engages your brain, even if it's many decades later, whereas you go before, you know, like Elvis and Frank Sinatra, it's just like dead, simple music. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, you have to maybe more be emotional about it to still love it. What, one thing that I think is kind of interesting is that like, you know, back even in like the early 2000s, but like especially in the 70s and 80s, is that like there were only a handful of bands that truly were famous and everybody listened to those bands. So everyone knew those songs. Like if you ask somebody in their 50s or 60s, like they're going to love the same 10 to 15 bands. But like today, there's so many people on SoundCloud and Spotify. And I mean, that we could make a song right now and upload it to Spotify. And that like it's so it's almost like 
a like a connection when I find somebody that likes the same music that I like. Yeah. Versus like, oh, did you hear that last Billy Joel song or whatever, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. And, and to me, I love that. I love lots of variety and lots of input. So my brain stays challenged. It's funny. Like, yeah, you think back in the 80s, like Seinfeld was considered an amazing show. But it, stuff like that. But it's like so simple, like just simple jokes. And like there's only three sets or whatever. And they just alternate between them. Like nowadays, a show like that wouldn't fly because the level of production value and quality has gone up so much. And now you have like Breaking Bad and, you know, Severance and these other shows that just blow the doors off the 1980s shows. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think we're better off for it, for the abundance. Yeah, I like it. Awesome, Pete. Well, if you want people to be able to find out more about you, where can people find out more about you? <laughs> it's always the same place, just MrMoneyMustache.com. And uh, okay. just poke around and you'll see nowadays I'm promoting this newsletter, which is just an email series like boot camp. So if you want to get like a bunch of lessons from my last 10 years of writing, like distilled into a weekly email, which is like non-promotional, I'm not selling anything on it, then that's probably the best way because it's like it's behavior optimized, right? Because you get something from me each week from the automated version of me and you learn a little bit each week over the course of a year. And uh, I think that's the most useful way. Awesome. Well, go check out if you haven't already been on MrMoneyMustache.com or even if you have, go check it out again as a quick reminder. And Pete, thank you so much for your time. I know we went a little bit over, um, but we wanted to make this episode a little bit special because this is Z's last episode. And yeah. um, of course, we love you, Z, Pete and Z. <laughs> so um, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Yes, I'm honored to be part of it. So best wishes and I'll see you on whatever you're doing next. Hope to be following along. Thank awesome. You. Thanks so much, man. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch. I can't wait to hear more about your Salada project. Yeah, cool. That's Hopefully exciting. it happens. So I've got to actually yeah. get to the closing in two weeks. Fingers and crossed for you. Did. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Have an excellent Awesome. See you guys. Tuesday. And that was Pete Adney, a.k.a. Mr. Money Mustache. Z, what did you think of Pete? Oh, I love speaking with Pete. It's just so inspiring and reassuring for me to see somebody who's like living it. You know, I think he's just living the lifestyle rather than talking about it. And I think so many of us get caught up in wanting to do something, but not being able to. And I loved why he was talking about the way that he does his schedule where he only has like one thing a day because if he has too many things in his future, it like messes up in his mind. And it really made me think about my journey with anxiety. It's like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense that if I've got things booked out months in advance in my schedule, that's all kind of sitting in my head somewhere. So maybe that mm -hmm. takes part in that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think like every time I talk to Pete, I'm like, you know what? I think I need to just like stop doing everything and just, I don't know. You know, it's like, it, like, and not yeah. to say that I'm obviously going to do that, but like, it's just like you kind of have that thought in your mind. Um, and, and I think it's like a good thought to have because it just creates balance, right? Like, um, you know, I, like I realized that I was taking on too much and like my one thing now is like, it's the fight team. Like, even my rental portfolio, I don't care to like, raise money and invest in real estate and do all that because like I wouldn't serve my investors well. And so like now I will continue to invest in real estate. That's my favorite vehicle to invest. I'll buy a property a year or two. I'll invest into some syndications and to some people that I know, like, and trust. But like, I really want my, that to be pretty passive and my main focus to just be on this. And, and I find a lot of fulfillment doing what I do. And so like, that's what makes me happy. And so like, yeah, yeah, I think it's, um, it really is really fun, really good, mm -hmm. a good perspective. Yeah, I think that's really important. We both mentioned that in this episode is like, what is your one thing? What is your main focus? And then making sure that the other things don't creep in. So yeah, I love that Mr. Money Mustache yeah. brings us back to a simple life. Yeah. A simple life and it brings us back to like basically where we started. And then we're like, oh, where are we at now? Look at us go. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah. So a good, a good perspective of an episode for sure. Guys, if you like this episode, please, please, please leave us a rating and review. It's super, super beneficial for us. And, you know, it just helps us spread the word. Like our, you know, our mission at the FI team is to reduce the U.S. retirement age, right? And so that's a big, a big, hairy, audacious goal. And so part of that is by spreading the word. And so if you wouldn't mind leaving a rating and review. 
and hitting us up. If you do leave a rating and review, you can hit me up on the Fi Guy on Instagram and Z your last time. Ziana McIntyre. Yeah. Come come say hi. She never changed her name. I didn't. <sighs> maybe, maybe Z will change your name now. No. <laughs> As a party gift. No pressure. <laughs> She's just like, no, absolutely not. Okay. Well, Z, it's been an honor and a pleasure to kind of be part of your life for the last couple of years and to be seeing you every week. I know I'm not going to be out of your life because you can't get rid of me that easily. We'll still be hanging <laughs> around and I'll see you at conferences and maybe we'll catch yes. up on a call now and again. But um, yeah, so but best of luck with everything. And guys, if you haven't Thank already, you. shoot Z on a DM and wish her the best of luck because um, obviously she's, she's on to, to greater pastures. So Z, it's been amazing and um, we'll talk soon. Bye. That's it for this episode of Investify. We hope that these nuggets of real estate wisdom lead to more savvy financial planning and a clearer path towards financial freedom. For more content like this, subscribe to the show at investify.com. Don't forget to leave a rating and share it with your friends. Together, we can transform more real estate newbies into successful and clever investors. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next one.